Welcome back motorized bike enthusiast. In today's video we're going to be upgrading the Kent Bayside to improve its ride quality, safety, and reliability as our daily driver. In case you missed it, I'll leave a link in the description to the original review of this bike and you'll understand why I've been using it as my daily driver. I'll be sure to leave a link in the description to all the parts used on this build. With that being said, let's get into it. Along our upgrade path we'll also be dealing with a few issues the bike has. To start, we have a flat rear tire, so that needs to be addressed. Some members on the Discord server and YouTube commenters have suggested getting a suspension seat post to add comfort to the already comfortable seat, so we got one of those. Now we also have an exhaust leak of some type, I'm assuming this is a bad gasket, we'll find out along the way. And then moving on to the cockpit, where we'll be addressing most of the issues I have with this bike, via its bad brake levers and terrible handlebar design. Getting started on the bike, we're first going to remove our light bracket, and I have a suggestion that will help save your bike lights in the future, we'll get onto that later. Then we're going to move on to removing the seat and seat post, and finally removing the mirror from the handlebars. Next we'll take an allen key and remove the rest of the accessories from the bike, I was lucky on this one, as the grips were easy to remove. After removing the handlebars, we go ahead and remove the stem as well. The stem on these bikes are not very good, they're adequate, but when applied with enough leverage they can slip and they just don't hold the handlebars very well. So I'll be upgrading them, not only with a longer design that will give me a better reach and comfortable seating position, but with ones that tend to grip onto the handlebars better, they're just higher quality. During the stem installation process we'll be adding a bit of grease to this friction nut which should allow you to easily make adjustments in the future. I'll also be adding a bit of WD-40 to the stem itself to help prevent rust as we plan on riding this bike every day and it's inevitably going to get wet. After eyeballing the stem into position we go ahead and insert the new handlebars. For this particular build I decided to go with a bit of lifted flat bars which will give me a more comfortable upright seating position while not contorting my wrist at the awkward angle. Taking a break from the front of the bike, we're going to move on to the seat post where I'm installing this Zoom suspension seat post, which comes in at about $30. I'm initially impressed with its build quality. Being an aluminum body, it won't rust inside the frame and become difficult to adjust later on. It has preload adjustments on the bottom and a nice boot covering the shaft with a decent amount of grease. Although I did add a bit more, but I really don't think it needed it. The only concern I have with the seat post is that it's the thinnest diameter I could find because that's the only thing that'll fit inside the Kent Bayside. So if you run into any aggressive terrain negotiation, aka you hit something really hard, there's a possibility that the entire post itself could snap being an aluminum body and the internal components take up precious space which could reinforce its design. However, when we get into the ride you'll see how it holds up. The post is a direct fit for the frame and the seat itself. Just take off your old one and plop it onto the new post. And then of course add any fine adjustments you need to so that all your important bits are nice and comfy. So I'm not a fan of the brake levers that come with the Kent Bayside. They have no barrel nut for emergency roadside adjustments, which just makes things a headache in the future. We're going to go ahead and replace these. Normally I would replace the brake levers with a dual brake lever setup on a bike like this, a cruiser not intended for trail riding or high speed, or at least not aggressive trail riding. Unfortunately, the dual brake lever that I like to use was not available from Amazon at the time of purchasing, so I decided to go with the all-in-one unit, which is a thumb throttle, dual brake lever, parking brake, and stoplight switch, which I might eventually use for something. The first one of these I ever bought didn't come with the parking brake bracket, so I couldn't figure out how it worked, and we never utilized it. But this one did, so yay, now I know how to fix the other one. Before I install this unit onto the bike, I'm going to go ahead and remove the main bolt for the throttle bracket and Loctite it. As one steering a ride, I had this come loose and I no longer had throttle. It was an easy fix, but kind of annoying. I'm not a big fan of thumb throttles due to the fatigue they add during long rides. However, I outweigh that with the fact that this is such a convenient unit to use that really does clean up the build. It's important to note that this particular braking unit applies even pressure to both the front and rear tire. It does this by use of a teeter-totter mechanism, so once pressure is applied from one cable, it'll rock and begin to apply to the other cable. You might be able to work your way around this by really adjusting the cable tension and barrel nuts, however I don't recommend it. It's better just to understand that both tires are getting even brake pressure and ride accordingly. There are levers out there that will allow you to fine-tune your adjustment so that you can apply pressure to one tire before the other. 
but you really need to know what you're doing and your riding style needs to work around that if you're going to use one of those brake levers. In order to make this work on some builds, you'll have to add a bit of a modification to the cable sleeves to make them fit, as well as round out the nubs on the end of the cable so that they'll also fit inside the cradle. Please be sure that when you're grinding down the nubs to fit inside one of these units, you're using a face mask. As this is metal, you don't want to be breathing it. I assume it's simply just a zinc tin composition, but I honestly don't know and don't want to find out. Luckily for me, while installing the cable sleeves into this particular unit, the Kent base side has an outer sleeve that fits over the cable, which makes them fit quite nicely inside the unit. It's not perfect, but they don't rock around too much, so I just left it as is. However, on my original build, the Bassett Blaster, the cable sleeves were real loose inside the barrel nuts, so I had to add some spacing. For me, I just used electrical tape and heat shrink, but you might find something else to work better. Now we're going to deal with that pesky flat tire. I like to use a bike stand when removing tires from a motorized bike, it just makes everything so much easier. However, this is a suspension seat post that's relatively cheap and thin, so I was a bit concerned that it might not be able to handle the up pressure of the build itself, as a motorized bike is substantially heavier than a standard bike. It did okay, but I wouldn't recommend this as everyday practice. Flat tires are common occurrences that everyone has to deal with, so we're not really going to cover them in this video. However, a few tips I have is be sure that once you remove the inner tube, before rotating it, you inflate it, so you can see where the puncture is and how many you have. In this particular situation, I had two punctures that I must have gotten back to back. For this build, along with most of mine, I'll be using the 80% thicker tubes from Goodyear. These used to be common on the Walmart rack, but they've since been replaced with the 30% thicker tubes. The 30s aren't nearly as strong as the 80s, but they're better than stock. An upgrade I've already done to this bike is replacing the rim liner with something thicker. In this case, I used an old inner tube from a beat-up bike. In other situations, I'll normally use Gorilla's 1-inch wide tape. While I have the rim off the bike, I'll go ahead and double-check all the nuts for the rag joint, just to make sure they haven't migrated or loosened up. A quick tip while installing the rear wheel is be sure to set your derailleur to its highest gear. This gives you more space to get around the sprockets. While we're working on the bike, we might as well go ahead and perform some of our usual maintenance. Something I've actually neglected for a little while on this particular build is cleaning and greasing the bucking bar. Well, I have an entire video on the clutch assembly you can go check out, link down in the description. These ones were neglected for a little too long, so I have to replace some parts. We're going to replace the clutch cam, bucking bar, and bucking bar bearing. Upon closer inspection of the grease and oil buildup near the exhaust port, we can confirm that this is in fact an exhaust gasket leak. We know this because there's no oil on the top fin which is shielded by the lower fin. If there was oil on the top fin, especially around the head gasket, there's a good chance you instead have a head gasket leak that's slowly seeped down towards the exhaust port. So don't let it fool you, and be sure to check. Before installing the new exhaust gasket, we're sure to scrub and lightly clean the mating surfaces, just so we can get a good seal. I always remove the stock aluminum fenders from my Cranbrooks and this Kemp base side. I do this for safety reasons. They just don't last unless reinforced. But to make a daily rider practical, fenders are kind of a must in my opinion, as you're inevitably going to ride through puddles, rain, and mud, especially where I work where the mud is just everywhere. Keeping mud from building up on your rear light is good for safety and reliability. Also, I want to keep mud from building up on the suspension seat post. It does have a dust cover boot, but if enough builds up on it, I'm sure it can find its way into the boot. And then, of course, there's the backpack and your back, which you don't want to put a trail on. When installing fenders on motorized bikes, even these plastic ones, be sure to secure them as well as you can. I reinforce mounting points with zip ties and just keep an eye on them over time. It's easy enough to find a decent quality set of bike lights for around $25 to $30. This particular set has me initially impressed with its build quality, but I've been here before. On motorized bikes, anything under $50 just doesn't tend to last very long, especially the front light. They're very susceptible to vibration due to the fact they have big batteries and they're heavy, so they bounce around all over the place on the handlebars. This plays hell on the mounting and the electronics. 
A good tip to help this front light survive longer than a few months is to simply take it off the bike during daytime riding. Put it in your backpack, or better yet, a bag mounted to your bike, like an under seat post bag, or one that fits on the triangle in front of the motor. That way you'll always have it when you need it, but it'll have a buffer and won't be bouncing around on the handlebars, vibrating itself to death. The rear lights can usually stay mounted to the bike. They'll handle the vibration just fine in most situations because they're so light that it just doesn't matter. However, water can still get into these even though they're water resistant. So I wouldn't recommend leaving the rear light or the front light on the bike if it's stored outside, as in humid environments, the charging ports will begin to corrode. This particular set has me impressed with its build quality. The mount is rock solid and thick. The light is heavy, has a big battery in it, and it even has a phone charging port. Very convenient. Both the front and rear lights are rechargeable, and they're water resistant. The light itself is very bright. So far it's the brightest one I've used on a bike. And I think it came in at about $25, but we'll say $30 just to be on the safe side. For that price, I'm impressed. In this particular build, I can use the cables as an actual buffer for the light. The light will conveniently sit on top of the cables at just the right angle. I realize this isn't going to happen for everyone, but use any advantage you can to help buffer out some of the vibration, because these big heavy batteries just don't like to shake. All that's left to do now is to clean up the bike and make it look pristine, and add a few stickers for fun, just to give it a little bit of a custom look. With all the modifications added to the bike and double checking everything to make sure it's tight and secure, we'll take it to work for its first test ride so we can see what fine adjustments we need to make the next day. <laughs> hey babe, come here a second. I left a tool sticking out of my bike. <laughs> Right out the gate, I can tell that the bike still needs some work. First, it's running a little rough because it's running very rich. At pretty much all RPMs except wide open throttle, we can hear four stroking. However, the modifications are a pleasant surprise. The handlebars are very comfortable, but do need to be raised a little bit. And the seat, well, the suspension seat post at first, I didn't know what to think about it. But I assumed it had a break in, which was correct, because during the first ride, eh, it was a bit stiff. When it would break loose during a bump, and then you could feel the suspension, but then it would stiffen back up again. We gave it a few days, and then we'll come back to our thoughts on that. Everything else on the bike feels good, so let's move on to day two. I don't know if you guys can see that, but it looks like we got... 300? 300 pounds. All right, all the fine adjustments have been made. Raise the handlebars a bit. Raise the seat just a tad more. And we have the new carburetor back on the bike. Had to lean out the needle on it before it was running too rich. I'm gonna have to get rid of this. Bumps on my knee, kind of hurts. This does too, but yeah, we'll live with it.
On day two, after making our fine adjustments by lifting the handlebars and the seat post slightly, the ride was much more comfortable. The motor has smoothed out by leaning out the carburetor, so we didn't have quite as much vibration and roughness. The suspension seat post had quickly broken itself in after only about a day's worth of riding. It lost its stiffness and was much more smooth. Negotiating rough roads and small potholes was a joy, and you could really feel it doing its job. Normally when I know I'm about to go over rough terrain, I'll add a bit of pressure onto the cranks with my legs to smoothen out the ride on my butt. With the suspension seat post, if you're fully loaded with a heavy backpack, you're still going to have to do this, but not nearly as much. I found going over the rough terrain at work, I only had to add a slight amount of pressure to keep the suspension seat post from bottoming out. However, when I'm just riding the bike without a heavy backpack, it does its job really well and I don't have to put any force down onto the pedals. This is going to vary depending on how much you weigh, but I would say an average full grown adult without a backpack can enjoy the full benefit of the suspension seat post. After about a day, it broke in and lost the stiffness and became very pleasurable to use. I'm happy I purchased it, I just hope it'll hold up. Being this is our daily rider, you can expect to see future videos updating you on any issues that might pop up. But assume that if I don't talk about these parts in future videos, it's because they're doing their job and I've had no issues with them. I'm sure some of you noticed, and maybe were even disappointed by, the fact that I didn't add any performance modifications to the motor in this video. I know you guys love to see those, but this is a daily rider and just something I need to be reliable and comfortable. If I need to pick a bike to just go somewhere to do something, this is the bike I'll use. I'll save the motor modifications for my other bikes, as they can sit under a tarp for a while as long as this one's running. A small bonus that I wasn't expecting to really use for a practical reason is the parking brake that's included with the dual brake lever. It's actually convenient, especially when you're using the kickstand. A big issue with stock cheap kickstands is the bike can still rock forward and backwards causing them to lose their footing and fall over. When you engage the parking brake, it doesn't move at all and just gives more of a solid base. I hope you guys enjoyed today's video and until next time, ride safe. Oh, yeah.